Hello, and welcome to the Millennial Nutritionist Podcast. I'm Isla Garcia, Master's Degree of Nutrition Science and Registered Dietitian, and I'm going to make weight loss realistic, sustainable, and uncomplicated for your busy lifestyle. On this podcast, me and my team of registered dietitians will decipher the latest nutrition research, dissect fad diets, and discuss social media trends for you so you can feel confident knowing what to eat to achieve your health goals. Research suggests that most weight loss programs aren't successful, but my experience has taught me that this is not because the participants aren't committed. It's because those diets are designed by non-nutrition professionals and center around severe restrictions. We are here to provide the facts about the science of weight loss so you can have the success you want and continue living your best life. Hello, my name is Isla, if you don't know, and I'm the founder and CEO of The Millennial Nutritionist. And today our podcast episode is going to be frequently asked questions about calorie deficit. So I feel like I've done so much talking about calorie deficit, um, but this is inspired by, and hopefully like a new approach because it's inspired by this re or this short, I don't know, like any, all the short form content, all the names, but on YouTube it's performed so well. It's like has over 170,000 views and it's me describing or trying to explain like the difference between being in a calorie deficit for a daily average. You'll just kind of have to go check out the re- the short or it's, I think if you even just like Google on YouTube, the millennial nutritionist, you'll be able to find it, but it has so many questions and continues to get questions about clarity around what being a calorie deficit is. Um, so I'm going to go over some of the top questions on that video. So make sure to always comment if you have questions, because I do take them in consideration for future episodes. Um, announcements for Millennial Nutritionist Company. Um, I just posted a quick meals guide from Aldi. That's our grocery guide of the month. I always do like a grocery guide or I try really hard to do a grocery guide every month. And this month is going to be inspired by just like some quick items or quick meal ideas that you can get from Aldi from their like freezer section or the, um, just like quick snack section, stuff like that, that I approve of for being like healthy. And that is over on millennial living. It's our membership platform and you get your first two weeks free, um, when you sign up. So you can check it out in the show notes or description or on our website. Without further ado, let's get into our topic. So I'm basically just going to spoil you with all the free information that I have from learning what calorie deficits are because it was like a big, like from working with clients over the past couple of years, because it was a really big learning curve. Um, all the other time I've had working in a calorie deficit. I mean, honestly, I guess it's like never, it's just been on like homework assignments from when I was in school. We work with calorie calculations when you, when I was working in a hospital, but it's not as a deficit. Most of the time it's just like maintain somebody's body weight when they're unconscious and they need like tube feeding or they have a stroke and they can't eat. So they need tube feeding, um, for those reasons, but that's highly controlled. It's a lot different than like when people are eating behaviors go into play when you actually have to decide what foods you eat for yourself. And I've learned a lot about calculating people, people's calories and like the nuances and the behaviors that go into it. So I'm just going to tell you what I've kind of learned, um, which is a big bonus for you because there's a big difference between what research says and what actually ends up playing out when you have worked with hundreds of clients and finally get into a good groove of knowing how to accurately calculate somebody's calorie deficit and what to expect from it. Um, okay. So I have, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, but there's one of them. It's like a two part, like, um, one of those. So it's kind of like five topics that come along with this, um, frequently asked questions about being in a calorie deficit. So the first thing is I didn't understand anything you said. <laughs> it's one of the first top comments. And again, you'll kind of have to watch the video. Basically it's like me describing what it's like when you try to really restrict like one day and then it causes you to backfire. And then if you add up all those calories at the end of the week, you are likely to be in a higher calorie range versus if you just are more conservative with your calorie deficit and you can follow it more closely and then you end up losing more weight even though you're like less aggressive every single day. Um, So what I was trying to explain, because you only get like 30 seconds in those videos, is you really need to be thinking about the daily calorie average instead of just one day per week. So I think where a lot of people get this wrong is thinking that they've done so well, like two or three days a week, and that should make a big difference. And unfortunately, the hard truth is 
It doesn't. You have to really be on top of it at least five to six days a week is what I try to get everybody to for all of the goals. Um, when you try to, it's and especially too, if you're being like super aggressive and saying like, okay, well, I'm going to cut out every single thing that I know isn't good for me that's high in calories, doesn't have like a benefit. I'm only going to eat protein um, and maybe some like low calorie crackers or something like that. And you're trying to only eat like a thousand calories. You might end up backfiring because you end up being so hungry and like you just feel so deprived and we live in a world where food tastes really good and is around us all the time that you end up overeating like through the weekend, which overall brings your calorie average higher versus just taking it slow and steady and maybe just like decreasing your calories here and there throughout the day helps you to be in a more in a deeper calorie deficit when you add that up throughout the week, which is how it works. And I go over that more in um, our program and in other videos, but that's what I was trying to kind of explain to show what it looks like throughout the course of the week to be more consistent with things. I was trying to think of like some comparison for how to explain this, because I do think it's like a hard topic to understand. And I saw and thought about it. And the only thing that I can kind of relate is maybe spending money. I also don't know if it's like the best analogy, but I know for me, this is what ends up happening. So like Sometimes I don't know if this ever happens to you where you like are trying really hard to like be on a really strict budget and you don't spend anything for like two or three days or like that's sometimes doable, but like calories wise, it would be the same if it were like two or three days. I feel like most of the time, if it's like, if you like go for like a week and you're like not going to spend any money on anything and like, you're just going to do with what you have and like try to be really strict on groceries and never eat out, you know, all of a sudden you want to spend like so much money because you've been depriving yourself is so then you end up just like splurging on this like really big item, but maybe you would have been able to save more money if you give like yourself a little treat of something every day. Like, yes, decrease your spending in areas, but don't go so restrictive. Like maybe instead of getting like a $500 pair of shoes, go for like a used pair that's $200 and you're still getting yourself a treat as opposed to not saying anything at all. And that's the same idea with being in a calorie deficit for the long term is trying to say like, hey, I really want a dessert. I'm not going to just not have one, but let's make it a high protein ice cream or let's just do like half the amount or something like that to where it still feels like you're not uber restricting yourself, but it's doable and you're not going to want to at one point, like way over E because you haven't been doing anything at all. So that's basically what I was trying to go over in that video. If you were totally missing it. Um, the next question or comment was how much of a deficit should I be in is like basically what I got out of this comment or question. Um, this person kind of like went into like her height and weight and stuff like that. Um, and then some other people commented, uh, the person like that I should have said to be in a 200 calorie deficit instead of a 500 calorie deficit or whatever. And I've played around with deficits as long as I've been doing this and seeing hundreds of clients and 500 is just what I go off of. It is kind of an arbitrary number because in order to have a deficit, you have to be really accurate in what you're giving, getting the deficit from, which is going to be your resting metabolic rate, which is basically, or not resting rate, your maintenance rate. So the rate that you are, um, having your body is using on a daily average to maintain its current body weight. And we do have calculations for that, but it is not accurate. And it's really hard to tell, even if you go to one of those machines, like what it looks like every single day for you, every minute of the day. Um, so I go off of 500 because I used to be more conservative and have people just do a two to 300 calorie deficit, but I didn't really see a lot of movement consistently for people. And I just do a three month program and I want them to get like the most results I can get in a safe way in three months. So for me, 500 is, is what I like. If you're doing it more slowly and aren't under like a time crunch, you might be able to do a 200, 300 calorie deficit. But again, the only way you would know you're in that much of a deficit is if that first number, your bait, your, um, your TDEE or the amount of calories that you need, your body needs to consume to maintain its weight is a hundred percent. Right. And we like really don't know. So like you could be in a 500 calorie deficit. You could be in a thousand calorie deficit. You could be in a 200 calorie deficit. Like I don't really like, don't get too caught up on the amount of deficit you're in. I always tell people, even with what I calculate for people, it is just a starting off point And then we adjust. 
And it's also like all in a balance of what you can do because yeah, you'll lose more weight the less you eat. But back to like my first uh, like question in this is you're not going to be able to lose weight if you can't stick with something. So maybe you would have more luck, like not being as much of a deficit as a 500 calorie deficit, or maybe you're somebody who can just do it. I have clients that I feel like have way more willpower than me and, and can do it. So trying to find that balance of what the amount of deficit that you can be to see loss is also a piece of the puzzle. There's not like a one size fits all. Um, and you also shouldn't really just be focusing on being in a deficit as far as like, that's the be all end all. And that's the reason you are and are not losing weight. That's just what I start with because that is the fundamental part of weight loss is being in the deficit, but it is also not going to be all the way accurate. Like nobody's going to track accurate. Like I can't even track accurately a hundred percent of the time, like, unless maybe it was like factory food or something like that. And I think there's still room for a lot of error. So that's why you should be also working on other habits like exercise and eating produce and all the things that I always talk about to see weight loss. So again, just like, don't get too caught up on this deficit number. You do need to be in a calorie deficit to lose weight, but try your best and then move on to other goals after you feel like you're in some sort of calorie deficit. If you feel like you struggle staying in a calorie deficit, um, I would recommend you listen to my episode about how to stay full when you're trying to eat less because I go into how to do that. I mean, I would say I've only ever had like three clients who struggle with this. So I don't think it's something that every single person should feel. But if you are one of those few people that really struggle with being hungry when you're in a deficit, then I would recommend you listen to that episode because I give you all my tips and tricks there. My next question or comment on the short video was I'm only five two. my maintenance to maintain my weight is 1800. So I have to go below that. And that is just a comment. So what I took from that is what goes into RMR. So, um, what goes into like what you have to eat to lose weight, because sometimes it can be frustrating or not even make sense why one person can eat more and lose weight. And what goes into what causes us to lose or gain weight at different rates, like that equation for getting your TDE. TDEE is your gender, weight, height, your fact that you are eating by mouth, your activity level, the um, non-exercise activity thermogenesis, which is basically just like the fact that you might move your hand when you talk or you move your head or you move your eyes and stuff like that also burns calories that we add in. And so a lot goes into that. Um, and there's other biological things like your hypothalamus controls your metabolism. And if you have hypothyroidism and it's not controlled, then you're going to have a slower metabolism. But the only thing out of those things that you can really control to change your metabolism or change the amount of calories that you can burn is your weight and activity level. Like we can't really change our, we're not going to be able to change your height. Um, you are going to eat by mouth either way. You're, you know, going to we always calculate adding like a certain percentage for that non-activity, non-exercise activity thermogenesis. But what you can do is try to exercise more to see more weight loss. Um, and then unfortunately, the less you weigh, the harder it is to lose weight because it drives down a part of that equation, which means that you have to eat less to lose more weight compared to somebody who is at a higher weight. Um, and then this is the hard part with my clients that are already within a healthy BMI range, or maybe they've lost a lot of weight on their own. And then they're just like struggling to lose the last like 10 pounds or something like that. You just really have to start cutting out more foods, which really isn't fun. I mean, it doesn't have to be restrictive, but sometimes it's like the difference between eating like a hundred calories of chocolate chips and 50 calories of chocolate chips. And it's like not the most fun thing as opposed to when you are at a heavier weight, you burn more calories. So you can do less to lose more weight in the beginning, which is helpful if you are starting out at a heavier weight and hopefully that's rewarding, but it can just be defeating once you've had so much success in the beginning. And then now you're having to really just stay on top of every single thing to be able to even just maintain a lower body weight. A sub comment of this is I'm eating 2,200 calories and losing weight. And yeah, I mean, everybody's calories are going to be a little bit different because of all those things that go into it. 
Um, gender is a big one. So boy versus girl is going to um, lose weight at different rates. Your height, a taller person technically can eat more to maintain or um, have more successful weight loss, all things that are not super fair. Um, but yeah, if you are at a higher weight and are super at, or are super active in a lower weight or a lower height, you could easily get away with eating 2,200 calories to lose weight. Um, I have two client stories to exemplify this. One is a client. She was able to eat over 200, 2,000 calories a day. And I believe she was already at like a healthy body weight um, in that BMI range. But she was super, super active, had a super active job, loved going to the gym, walked all the time. And so she was able to lose weight eating more calories. So it definitely can be done. Um, and then I also had a mom client once who, um, I don't know why I said mom client, but I had a client who came to me and she was eating a lot before we started working together, like 2,800 to 3000 calories a day. And it was on, um, I think more of like the obese range of her BMI just to show what she weighed. Um, but because she was eating so much coming into it, I can only assume that her metabolism was pretty high because the more you eat, sometimes the more efficient your metabolism is, even if you're at a higher weight. But she could lose weight eating within that like 2,000 calorie range because it was kind of like such a shock to her system to eat any less than 3,000 calories. So both of these just show that, yeah, you people out there can eat less. You could, I mean, in, can eat more and lose weight. You could potentially eat more and lose weight, but it's so individualized based on your weight, what you come in eating with, you know, for somebody who has been eating a very low amount of calories for a really long time, you're going to have to just eat even less to lose weight. And that's not super fun. So it's not always worth it to like cut the calories way down. So all this to say, there are a lot of nuances and a lot of individual factors that go into how many calories you can eat and lose weight. And it's definitely not the same from person to person at all. The next two tips <laughs> our next two uh, frequently asked questions are brought to you by a podcast ad. And I'm going to just add on a live podcast ad while I'm talking here. Um, I've been enjoying doing these affiliate links as I'm not really advertising as much for my own programs right now, but this is something that I actually have been drinking on my own and like talking about. So I thought I'd bring it up again and it is fire belly tea. So with a new month comes a new product that I'd like to share. And for June, it's all about fire belly tea. A lot of people have been interested in non-alcoholic alternatives and their iced tea is great. It's zero calorie option to keep stock for when you're tired, just plain water. If you know me, I'm all about eating whole natural foods and tea is just that. I feel like people forget about this OG water alternative. So I'm going to remind you of some of the benefits. Fire belly teas are loose leaf, which make it easier, which make it taste better and also are infused with herbs, spices, and fruits. They're also just like super vibey, like the, um, the flavors that they have are just super on trend. What really sucked me in was their packaging, the flavors, and the bespoke iced tea carafe, which I use. Sometimes we choose the higher calorie drink options because the marketing sucks us in and makes us think that it's the cooler option. But we can make low calorie drink options cool too, and we don't feel like we're depriving our we don't feel like we're depriving ourselves of the fun drink experience. They also have just so much to choose from. They have green tea, black tea, herbal tea, ma tea tea, matcha, oolong, and my favorite right now, which is iced tea. You can take their online quiz for a customized recommendation catered to your desired drink. Um, time to drink the tea, benefit, and flavor. When I took the tiz quiz, it recommended the after dinner mint, which is, I mean, after, yeah, after dinner mint, which is chocolate mint and valerian root and the crowd pleaser, which is black tea um, with vanilla and almond, because I like more of like a chocolatey tea vibe. My personal favorite though, is the uh, Caribbean dream and making it iced. Um, and it has pieces of coconut, pineapple and apple, apple crisp, but it feels like I'm having a pina colada without all of the calories or like the grogginess from actually having alcohol. They also have a, a lot of recipes on their blog that I want to try with some of the iced tea blends. So I can turn it into more of like a mocktail, like Thai iced tea and peaches and um, peaches and Caribbean coconut lime tea. Um, they reached out to, when they reach out to me to try their product. Um, and as soon as I opened the box, I knew this would be our next podcast sponsor because they're not making any like crazy health claims about it being like skinny tea or like moussey metabolism. They're really just trying to advertise their teas. And as a dietitian, I think it's a great alternative to other drinks. 
Um, so swapping out the higher calorie alcohol on these like hot June days to fire belly tea could help you to achieve the calorie deficit you need to reach your health goals. Go to www.firebellytea.com slash Isla, I-L-L-A, all caps to, and use the discount code Isla, I-L-L-A, all caps at checkout to receive 10% off. Um, but back to calorie deficits and what you need to know about it. So this next comment is the, I've been on the OMAD diet for over a year, lost 56 pounds in four months, 2,200 max calories. Um, so cool. And what I'm going <laughs> to take this as is like, does it matter when you eat your calories? And no, not really like metabolically. It shouldn't matter if you you know, controlled every single thing about a person and you gave them 2,200 calories over the course of like four meals versus somebody who eats it all at once. It shouldn't matter based on what research says, but I don't think it's realistic. <laughs> um, and I don't really find success with people trying to save it up for one meal. So, I mean, I've never had somebody come to me and say that they really want to do this and lose weight, but I have had people try to come to me saying that they're going to like save up for dinner or like save up for the weekends. And I feel like it always backfires for them because they think they can have so many more calories than they actually have. And this happens to me too. If I'm like, oh, I'm like, had like such a like small calorie breakfast. I'm going to add some more calories onto dinner. It's typically only like 100 to 150 calories, which is like a slice and a half of cheese or something. Not like we can be having like a whole dessert and stuff like that. So I think it's just better to just get in the habit of eating like normal consistent meals throughout the day. If you don't like doing that, again, it's not going to hurt you, but you don't have to only eat the one meal a day, which is what the OMAD stands for to lose weight. I also don't know if like people even really do that because some people do tell me that they not like clients, but normal people in my like everyday life will tell me that they only eat one meal. Like I only really eat one meal a day. And I'm like, oh, like you don't really eat anything else throughout the day. Like what are those snacks that I saw in your pantry? They're like, oh, well, I'll eat like a Belvita cracker for breakfast and then I'll have like a coffee and I'm like, okay, so that is breakfast. Even if it's only 250 calories, that is a meal. Um, and then they'll be like, well, I'll have like a granola bar, but then I'll eat a really big dinner. I'm like, okay, so you still are having three meals. Like they're very unbalanced, but you're not only having one thing a day. So I think also evaluate if you're actually doing this or if the person telling you this is actually doing this, because I've never really met somebody who literally doesn't eat anything besides 2,200 calories and one meal once a day. Um, but I will say if cutting yourself off at certain times helps, then I can see how this can work for you. Like, I think we all have those certain, just like food rules that work for you. For example, like no eating after dinner or like no snacking in between meals or no alcohol on weekdays. So if doing something like that helps you to have clear boundaries around when you're going to eat and when you're not going to eat, even if it's like the old school rule of like eating at the table versus not in the car, you know, stuff like that, I think can still help you to be in a calorie deficit. So you can exercise some time restriction, but it doesn't have to be as extreme as this to see weight loss. And then a lot of people, um, in the video, this last question comment, were asking about like accuracy of what their Apple watch is telling them they burn, um, my fitness pal calculating the calories. And I have done a whole podcast episode about what I think about this online calorie calculators, like what you should know about them, how you can use them, stuff like that. And I just like for sure would not go off of what the Apple watch says. I use the Apple watch, not really for clients. That's why I like steps instead, but for myself, I do use it. And I use it more so as like an effort level to show, like, I'm hoping that it's going to track my heart rate and the amount of time my heart rate was at a certain rate. And that's like my points level is what I think about it. I never think like, oh, I burned 500 calories. I can eat 500 calories, but I just try to keep that amount consistent. Like to say like, okay, if I walk 10,000 steps and I do my four days of strength training by the end of the week, I typically get to around X amount of calories. And as long as I keep that consistent, then I should be able to, you know, eat a certain amount and keep everything in check just like for consistency purposes. Cause if all of a sudden that number drops down to like 200, then maybe I should evaluate eating a little bit less. But I definitely would not go by what the Apple Watch says for what how many calories are burned. Um, the best thing to do is actually to go off of how your actual weight is responding. And this is what I do to clients. It's important. And if you're going to do this to track and track accurately for a couple of weeks, is actually what I kind of just had to do for myself because I'm gaining a lot of weight every week during pregnancy. I was like, okay, well, let's, let's rein this back in. Let's 
track for like a week and see what my average intake is and then just decrease the calories from that. So you can do this for yourself, track for a week or two. And then that is the amount of calories that you're eating to maintain your current body weight if you're not losing any weight. So then just decrease calories from that. Um, it could also, you also do need to make sure that you are tracking enough days and tracking correctly to be able to achieve that. But that is like going to be the absolute best way to figure out your calories. Because when I work with clients, I estimate their calories. So we have them to start out with, and I would say like seven and a half times out of 10, I don't have to do any adjustments, but I do have to adjust sometimes, um, if to decrease the amount of calories they're eating. And I do a very small amount. And then we just adjust to try to find that sweet spot every week. Um, because people are never going to calorie track all the way. Right. Like I said, we don't always know what your internal metabolism is, but we do need that starting off point. And then we just adjust as we go. And sometimes I have to adjust in the opposite direction. Sometimes somebody's like losing two pounds a week and I'm like, are you okay? Are you too hungry? And they're like, yeah, I'm too hungry. I'm like, okay, let's increase it by a little bit. So you have a little bit more wiggle room and you're not hungry all the time. So all that to say, I totally would not go by what the calorie calculators say. I would try your best if you're doing it on your own to just track what you eat for a couple of weeks and then know that that's your maintenance calories likely and then decrease from there. If you're working with a dietitian, they'll probably do it how I do it, where they calculate and adjust. But yeah, try not to use the online calculators um, or use it as like the ride or die. It might be a good starting off point, but don't say like, oh, I'm not losing weight. Like my you know metabolism must be messed up because the online calculator didn't give me the right number or something like that. Whew, I'm getting like increasingly more out of breath the more I do these. <laughs> But that is the episode for today. Um, the most asked questions or the most popular questions about being in a calorie deficit, according to that short, I hope you benefited from it. Um, your call to action today is to sign up for the email list. So you always get the new podcast episodes that are ad advertised, always get the announcements. You always get any new content because we're posting all over on YouTube, on podcasting, on Instagram millennial living and I'm like forever downloading and redownloading like social media apps. So if you're like me and you're always on your email, I think it can be helpful to just get that like twice month advertisement of what we're doing. So you can keep up with all the free tips that we're giving out, but I hope you enjoyed the episode and I'll hopefully see you next week. Bye. Thank you so much for listening to the millennial nutritionist podcast. For daily weight loss tips and nutrition information, you can find us on Instagram at the.millennial.nutritionist and on TikTok at millennial.nutritionist. If you find this information helpful, please subscribe to the podcast and share it with a friend who needs encouragement on their health journey. See you in the next episode.